or start sharing the screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new edition of the case records of the Mayo Clinic Florida Neurosurgery. Uh, today I'll be presenting a case of the Q service. First of all, I would like to thank everyone involved in the care of these patients, including uh, Dr. Quinones, Dr. Sherman, Dr. Trifoletti, Dr. Gentoff, Dr. Wessel, Dr. Ravinder, and Dr. Gilbrooks. So this case is about a 29-year-old female that first presented in September of this year uh, with a, a one-week duration of episodes of headaches, dizziness, and fatigue. Uh, she was evaluated at an outside institution in Mexico City. And uh, after further interrogation, she actually reported uh, several weeks history of also fatigue and night sweats. Uh, she was finally diagnosed with viral meningitis and a CSF analysis revealed the presence of Coxsackie virus. So at the end of this presentation prompted an MRI scan at the outside institution to complete that full neurological evaluation. Uh, past medical history and family history were non-contributory. Uh, she was healthy otherwise, and there was no history of any malignancy or any other syndrome in, in her family. On physical examination, her head was normal cephalic and untraumatic. The cranial nerves were grossly intact. There was no plenary drift, full strength throughout, and reflexes were normal as well. So uh, everything seems to, to, be, to be normal. Uh, this is the, the MRI taken at the outside institution in Mexico. This is a sagittal uh, T, T1 post contrast, where you can see a lesion occupying the four ventricle, indicated here by uh, this, blue, this blue line. Here in the actual, in the actual cut, we can see that there is a little contrast enhancing involving this lesion. And, and the lesion is almost occupying the, the, uh, the complete diameter of the four ventricle, but there was no evidence of, of obstructive hydrocephalus up to this moment. So here's an axial T2. There was some T2 heterogeneous signals and, and also a cystic component of this lesion. So several differential diagnoses were, were brought up that we'll discuss in this presentation. But at that point- oh, in, Carlos, really quick. Uh, did you yes. have a DWI by chance? Uh, I did not at this okay. point. Yeah, those are important to look at. Uh, you wanna know whether tumors in this region restrict. Um, once you get to the differential, once we start discussing that, I'll explain a little bit further why, but, but that's a, an important thing that you wanna look at because certain types of tumors back here will restrict. Um, okay. So yeah, this one also, I'll, I'll, I'll always consider that. Perfect, thank you. So at that point, uh, the patient was discharged from the hospital in, in Mexico after a week. Uh, she was on bread zone and she still complained of, of this and and mild headaches. Uh, her doctor over there ordered a PET CT just to make sure there was no uh, evidence of any other lesions in her body, and this was negative. And at that point, she was referred to Mayo Clinic Florida to, to, to complete an evaluation. Uh, at the beginning, she had a virtual visit, and at that point, three differential diagnoses were discussed, including an ependymoma, subependymoma, uh, glioma, and metalloblastoma. Uh, Ola, right here, I don't know if you want to comment on the difference between this. Yeah, so um, for subependymomas, I think I've chatted about this with some of the, the uh, junior residents. So um, actually, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Montessor, what, what, would, what would tell you that this uh, either would be or would not be a subependymoma, for example? And there's a particular feature of subependymomas that can kind of distinguish them from other fourth ventricular tumors. Well, um, as far as I know, subependymomas, um, they tend to occur at like um, uh, early age and they tend to kind of like um, go through the foramen of um, uh, Lushka on both sides uh, in terms of uh, radiology. Sometimes uh, they can show um, minimal diffusion restriction, but uh, that's pretty much their 
um, kind of like radiographic uh, appearance. Yeah, and also they don't enhance. That's uh, they, they don't they don't enhance. That's that's correct. They don't enhance. Yeah. Uh, they are pretty like the uh, their moids as well. They don't enhance. Yeah, exactly. That's the uh, one of the important things to kind of differentiate yeah. that one from the other ones. And um, uh, as far as diffusion restriction, um, ependymomas, you will see some uh, restriction. And uh, medulloblastomas actually because they're so dense and highly cellular. They also, um, it's mixed, but they also can have some uh, diffusion restriction as well. So those are things you want to consider, but you also, but you want to look at the full gamut of uh, radiological imaging, just to be able to differentiate some of those, uh, those features that I mentioned. Great, well, thank you. And I'm also wondering if there was any uh, head CT that was obtained in that case. Uh, no, she, she went straight and had an MRI there and she came here. And, uh, let me see, uh, Dr. Domingo, is there anything else you would want to consider uh, anytime you have a fourth ventricular tumor? Is there any other imaging anywhere else that you would want to, uh, to look at? Yeah, so I'll, I'll want to check uh, for the uh, neuroaxis, spinal neuroaxis. I want to make sure that there's not drop metastasis. Some of these tumors can have other lesions uh, down the spinal cord, and that will change also my management. I want to make sure there is not obstructive hydrocephalus I will, to address for a CSF diversion if needed. Um, those will, will be the two main things that will come to my mind. Exactly. Good. Awesome. Thank you. At that point, uh, surgical intervention was discussed with this patient uh, due to her young age and, of course, to get, to get tissue for diagnosis. So she ended up coming to, to coming to to uh, Mayo Clinic Florida for for a face to face evaluation, and uh, she got this new MRI. In this sagittal view, we can actually see uh, that the contrast enhancing com component had increased in size, uh, and it was less than two less, less than a two month follow up. Uh, here in the in the cervical spinal cord, you can also see some evidence of contrast enhancing leptomeningeal dissemination. Here in the axial T2, we can, we can take a better look at this contrast enhancing component. And, and it was also reported that the lesion increased in size in this month and a half, more or less. Here on the left cerebellar hemisphere, we can see uh, also a contrast enhancing lesion on the left side. And as uh, Ricardo and Olu just said, it is important to get, of course, uh, uh, an MRI of the whole spine. Here's a, a cervical spine MRI, and, and we can see uh, the diffuse involvement I was telling you about. Here's the sagittal T2. The, the biggest component is right here, anterior to, to the cervical spinal cord. Uh, interestingly enough, also in the thoracic spine, there was some evidence of uh, what appears to be an intramedullary, intramedullary uh, T2 hyperintensity that you can see right here. And this is an axial view of, of the whole spine where we can actually see as well some evidence of uh, intramedullary T2 hyperintensity. <coughs> So, uh, of course, these findings were, were discussed with the family, and, and again, it was, uh, it was mentioned, of course, the, the, the malignant potential of this lesion and, and the urgent need to proceed with surgical intervention. Again, these three differential diagnoses were, were discussed again, and, and uh, the goals of the surgery were to obtain tissue for diagnosis, uh, to know, of course, to know uh, what we're leading. Uh, and and to get uh, to 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 decrease uh, the disease burden of this patient, of course, uh, there were no really other alternative approaches, as it was important to to know what this lesion was. So uh, the team proceeded with a midline suboccipital craniotomy for for tumor resection. Uh, Dr. Quinones, Dr. Wessel, and Dr. Rabindran led this surgery. Uh, the patient was taken to the operative room, position prone. 
uh, and EBD was placed first on the right side. Here you can see a midline suboxibial incision being made. Uh, the dissection was carrying down into planes. As you can see, all the way down to the, to the C1 vertebrae. You can see it right here in the image. Two burr holes well placed. Um, and uh, the granatomy flap was shaped with a, with a B1 foot plate, as you can see right here in the video. The granatomy flap was turned, and a diamond rail was used to further shape the, the granatomy side. The dura was open in a, in a way shaped fashion. And here uh, you can start seeing the, the microscope section of the video. A telovial approach uh, was the preferred one in order to, to get access to the, to the fore ventricle and start dissecting the area. You can see right here that the arachnoid was already open and the tonsils uh, separated from the side. Here, Dr. Q and Dr. Wessel started dissecting the, the area and you can start seeing a little bit of tumor in there. Dr. Wessel, I don't know if you're on the line and, or you would like to comment on the surgery as well. Yeah, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you're touching on all of the uh, key points that, you know, the one of the challenging aspects of this is just the uh, positioning of your microscope and how you have to kind of crane your neck over to look basically up along the floor of the fourth ventricle. Sometimes it's it's an awkward position and it's, um, I think it's really helpful to have an extra set of hands to aid in uh, dynamic retraction as, as you kind of work your way up and around the tumor. Thank you, Dr. Wesson. So here, uh, tumor forceps were used to, they will get tumor first from the inside. And also a combination of suction and bipolar uh, was used to, to take the tumor out and perform the debulking. So the tumor appeared to be soft and sockable. And at this point, uh, the lesion was dissected off uh, the roof and the walls of the fore ventricle with micro scissors as well. This is the most inferior portion of the tumor being removed. The vermis was completely intact through the whole duration of that procedure. And here you can see a, a big portion of the tumor being, being removed as well. At that point, attention was turned to the, the most superior portion of the lesion, which I believe was the most challenging one. But again, with a combination of bipolar and, and two more forceps, uh, this lesion was able to be removed with, with no further complications. The air was, was irrigated and also some uh, portions of the several hemispheres were uh, bipolar just to avoid any, any microscopic disease. The dual was closed with a dual patch. Uh, the granary flat was placed. Uh, fibrin glue was also used and the, the wound was closed in layers. And here's the pathology report by Dr. Gentat. So this case was uh, quite interesting. If you look at it, it's what we call in pathology, a small round blue cell tumor. Um, most of the time in the cerebellum, this means a medulloblastoma. Uh, but you also have to exclude things uh, like lymphoma, or you could have a small cell glioblastoma. If we go to the next slide, this particular tumor had some interesting features. I will. Um, the starred area shows an area with uh, less uh, tumor cell density. Um, but when you look at it on higher power, if you go to the next slide, this is uh, this consists of neurons, and they do appear to be a component of the tumor. Now, um, when we do stain this case, and we go to the next slide, 
we can see that it stains positive for synaptophysin and it's negative for GFAP. So this fits well for an embryonal tumor or um, most likely a medulloblastoma. However, given the um, neuronal differentiation, it also brings in some other uh, much rarer tumors such as a CNS ganglioneurocytoma. The, all of these tumors are in the same family, but now uh, many of them are being molecular, uh, molecularly defined. So if you go to the next slide, it's the diagnosis. We're still waiting on a uh, complete panel of molecular testing to really define exactly what type of embryonal tumor this is. I do favor a medulloblastoma with just some areas of uh, ganglion differentiation. Uh, however, I can't exclude other uh, types of embryonal tumors. Um, and it should be pretty apparent when we get the molecular testing back. Thank you, Dr. Gentoft. Dr. Gentoft, do you usually not see homoride rosettes and that sort of thing on medullos? Uh, often, oftentimes you don't, no. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, a lot of the classic things that you see in textbooks um, do they occur, but at a rate that's not um, as high as is what you would think. So uh, in this case, I didn't see uh, anything like that. Okay, thank you, sir. So these are the postoperative scans. This is a SAGLT1 post contrast. You can see a really nice resection of the four ventricular lesion. There was no evidence of contrast enhancing lesion left behind. Although uh, here in the T2, we see some uh, T2 signal changes in the four ventricle that it could be related to postoperative changes, of course, but uh, we still need to consider uh, the possibility of, of a residual lesion. I, I think most likely is residual. And is, is Dr. Wessel here on the line by any chance? Because we did well, this. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm yeah. here, sir. Yeah, because we did this case together. And is that the, is it the case that you and I did? Yeah, this is it. Yes. So at the roof, you know, I think that this is, you know, obviously we, she's a young patient. Uh, we're concerned about cerebellar mutism, taking out all those midline structures. And we knew that... Uh, you know, especially at the roof, there could also be, we didn't have a perfect visualization. I think probably they show the video, but uh, we know that if we get too aggressive, we can cause a very mark deficit. And we knew already intraoperatively in the frozen section from Mark that we, he was favoring a medulloblastoma. We also know that we have some other lesions, satellite lesions and, and uh, cervical medullary junction. So I think that if I remember correctly, Aaron, we made a conscious decision not to get too aggressive up against the roof. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Was there anything else uh, from, from your side, Aaron, as far as teaching pearls for the residents about this case, either from the surgery or, or the decision making that you want to share with our, with our residents here? I mean, I, th I think this is a, uh, there's a lot of pearls from this case from a resident perspective, you know, spanning from junior residents up to the more senior, you know, number one just starts with positioning, making sure that you're happy with pin sites. Uh, we, we had an incident where the patient bucked and the pin site slipped and lacerated the top. I mean, this, that's just kind of one-on-one. Um, so we ended up having to reposition and repin. Um, and I can and say something. I, I love what you did in that case, by the way. Because Aaron called me and he says, I like to just stop and recalibrate everything and re, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, make sure that all the navigation is done again. And I said, I agree. I think it's the right thing. Whenever there is a doubt, you know, because you can see where we are and you can see us working right there. I said, I favor that. Stop, pause, redo it again. Because he said, I don't trust the navigation system. And I really congratulate you, Aaron, for doing that. That's a perfect thing to do. Um, and then, you know, uh, I was just telling Christian on as we did it, you know, just some, uh, you know, basic steps of the exposure. I think it's nice to take your time initially, get a nice midline, uh, you know, dissection down the midline rafe and expose out laterally to get the suboccipital region open and find the C1 arch midline and work out early uh, on the inferior aspect of C1, making sure that you don't go too lateral and region of the vertebral artery. Um, you know, and then there's a lot of, 
uh, you know, there's some nuances to the Tito Wheeler approach, but understanding uh, those aspects are important as well and why you would choose that approach as opposed to transvermian and um, the anatomy of the fourth ventricle. So I, I think this is, overall is a great case. Lots of lots to learn from it from all aspects. But I'm happy to have done that with you. No, I was thinking, I think that people can see us working with uh, four hands, you know, the two of us together dancing, no retraction in the brain and just going around the lesion. And it was such a joy to work with, uh, with Aaron. I, I rarely have the opportunity. I love working with the residents, of course, with Krishna and with, uh, with James and, um, and uh, Olu as well. And it's, it's with everybody. It's like when you dance with someone else, every partner that you dance with, the dance is a little bit different. And, and I enjoy dancing with all of you guys. And I really do see what we were doing right there as a dance. You guys saw us going back and forth. And I do the same dance with Krishna and I do the same dance with Olu. And I have done the same dance, of course, with James as he's beginning to scrub more and more with me. It's a, I really, it's um, seeing that video, by the way, Carlos editing that video is beautiful. I really remember it brought back those memories of going around the tumor, disconnecting the blood vessels. And I think that that's at the pace that you're moving. When you're dancing with someone, you got to move your hands around, your instruments around, anticipate the moves, the cuts, ask for an instrument, and so on and so forth. And I think that those, uh, those dances are absolutely stunning. So thank you for editing that video. And thank you, Aaron, for your insight in the surgical pearls. Olu, any other thoughts from your side before we go to the post-ops, uh, uh, um, actually the last pearls and how the patient did and stuff like that? Yeah, no, that was, uh, I mean, I think we covered all the salient points. Um, we talked about some of the anatomy, but uh, I think we can go. I was going to actually ask one of the residents uh, some of the uh, fourth ventricular floor anatomy once we get to the, uh, to the uh, how she did. Um, but yeah, I think overall, you you know, Dr. Wessel and you did a, I mean, a phenomenal job and uh, covered all the salient points um, with positioning and, and, uh, you know, transitioning and working uh, together uh, on a case like that. So I think everything went well. All right. Keep going then. Thank you, everyone. So there were no intraoperative complications and uh, she had another eventful postoperative course. She was discharged home on postoperative day five, and she continued to have evaluations by neuro-oncology and radiation oncology. Um, and although we're still waiting for the final uh, molecular panel, uh, the recommendations on the way are to continue with craniospinal prone therapy and chemotherapy as well. So, so, mm -hmm. real quick. Um, so Dr. Robin John. I think we've discussed this before with, when we were talking about some of the fourth ventricular floor anatomy, but the patient didn't wake up with any new cranial nerve deficits, but say she woke up with uh, a facial palsy as well as um, difficulty moving um, one of her eyes laterally. Why would that be the case? And what um, specific location do you think that could happen at? So we're dissecting on the back of the facial colliculus and we're close to the abducens nucleus as well. Um, yeah. I, I, so I, the lateral gaze palsy as well as facial palsy may be a complication. Yeah. So what 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 about that area? Or I guess um, what is uh, can you kind of talk about the, the correlation between those structures that you just mentioned? Did you mean so like? Yeah. So you said that in that region. So uh, what? Uh, I guess I was just asking, how were they? They were sitting there? right dorsal to the facial colliculus. So if the tumor had extended more ventrally, I guess we could have um, caused edema against by dissecting against the facial colliculus. Yeah, basically, I was just getting at you know that the uh, Ducens nucleus is below that the uh, nerve wraps around it. So yeah, good job. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Olu and Krishnan. Um, so this diagnosis favor medulloblastoma, as you all know, this is the most common type of pediatric brain cancer, but in adults, it represents less than 1% of all intracranial tumors. And it's estimated that in the United States, it is uh, diagnosed in a total number of um, 140 per year, more or less. Um, this is uh, the Chang classification of, of medulloblastoma. Uh, it is usually subdivided between high risk and low risk, depending on the dissemination 
specifically on this patient, it was considered a, as a T4 due to the spread beyond the agudal of Sylvius and the foramen magnum, and as an M3 due to a gross nodal sitting in the spinal subarachnoid space. Uh, usually in low risk, it is, um, it is considered normal to proceed just with radiation therapy, but in those patients as high risk, of course, chemotherapy uh, is the way to go. Uh, there are several subclassifications of metalloblastoma, and of course, the overall survival virus between these two, these three uh, subtypes that I'm showing up here. But uh, overall, the five year overall survival is between 47 and 80 percent. So, I'll, be I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Maybe I can, I see Gabriel, Dr. Vargas from, from Colombia, and Dr. Name Guerra here. Maybe Gabriel, you want to make any any comments, uh, any thoughts? You know whether the management, preoperative positioning, the pearls that you teach your own residents and your students there. Yeah, uh, no, excellent case as uh, you mentioned before. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, we're perfect, okay. perfect, Gabriel. Yeah, oh, very okay, well. Okay, okay. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I think that one of the main difference in different teams are the position of the patient. Uh, for me, sitting position, I don't feel comfortable doing that in sitting position, but I know that many surgeons do all this kind of surgeries in sitting position and they show very nice cases, very nice dissection, teloveral approach and all of that. And the second thing is that the, the situation with the vermix. We need to be very careful with the vermix, with the management of the vermix in this kind of lesion, because this would be the change of the postoperative morbidity. Uh, in fact, the mutims that you mentioned before and other main lesion. And the other fact is the arteries, especially the pica, because many times the pica is common up, not down, as usual in anatomic position, uh, we be careful with, with that. So for me, one thing is the arteries. The other thing is how I can dissect without damage any uh, cerebellum uh, uh, lobule or something like that. And uh, otherwise, it uh, was a very good case, nice case. This case and the case before of the a spine tumor by all of, uh, good cases but thank you very much beautiful thank you gabriel and I've, and i'm going to pivot right now let me ask and then i'm going to ask dr name to also comment dr name guerra go ahead and comment on that and then i'm going to ask one of the residents a question thank you just for a, a, a short uh, um comment about the uh, don't forget to put an external ventricle drain before this kind of surgeries this is the only uh, um, in that case that you have as well as well or do you have a acute hydrocephalus you can manage them with the external ventricle drain this is a really really good case and unfortunately the the prognosis of the patient is not good thank you Dr. I love it I love that we were ready actually we we had the navigation we had already uh, sort of located the area where we would put we decided not to put it preoperatively, but we were definitely ready right there. We were not going to leave the room. If we felt that there was a lot of, you saw that the, we we ended up getting very lucky. The biology was good to us. We came around the tumor, dissected. We found the pica, as uh, as Gabriel mentioned. We cut, you saw us cutting some of the small little vessels coming to the tumor, leaving the pica intact and so on. It was definitely riding a little bit higher than normal. And at the end, everything was quiet. There was nothing, the brain was very relaxed, you know, and uh, so we felt that it was appropriate not to put an EVD, but we were definitely, definitely ready. No question. That's a very, very good point. Well, let me ask Dr. Montaser, what is cerebellar mutism? Because everybody, you can see the big concern. That's the main morbidity, and Gabriel and, and, and Dr. Namiguerra mentioned this right here. So remind us, Dr. Montaser, what is cerebellar mutism? What is it consistent of? I think you're muted, Allah. I see you're trying to with, get unmuted. With mutism. With mutis. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, there you go. Now Can you, you hear me muted. now? 
Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. So that, that what happened was just kind of like some sort of <laughs> mutism, actually. <Yes. laughs> uh, so the cerebellar uh, mutism, uh, it's very common when there is a um, uh, transaction of the uh, vermis, uh, like in, in a transpermian approach, uh, where the patient has kind of like diminished uh, speech and uh, emotional uh, ability as well. Uh, kind of a, some sort of mutism overall in terms of like speech or movements, uh, hypotonia and some ataxia as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Absolutely, absolutely true. And then I see JP, Dr. Almeida, who's one of our associate surgeons and everybody's familiar with his work. JP, I see your hand up. Uh, hello, everybody. Again, no. Just in terms of the 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 two, two surgical comments uh, that that will complement what we discussed, uh, I think that one of the nice ways to kind of sometimes maximize that approach to the upper part of the fourth ventricle and even to the roof as well, and as well to the lateral recess, is additional to opening the inferior medullary uh, inferior medullary valve and also opening the telechoroid area as it goes into the roof of the wing of the tonsils to both sides. That kind of facilitates when you're going to put your retractor near the vermis, which should also be done with careful and gives you a bit of a better angle. And the position of the head with as much flexion as possible will be quite very important when you need to look up all the way to the aqueductus silvius. So that needs to be, to be kept in consideration. And as it's shown beautifully in the video, when additional to opening the inferior medullary valve and the telechoroid there, when you're mobilizing the tonsils, it's important to be very careful, cut the additions into the, the pica to the tonsils in the tonsillo medullary segment as, as it's shown in the video so you can retract safely. And the other detail that is quite useful in this case as well is if you had hydrocephalus here as well and you had like to consider a permanent diversion or something like that, uh, preoperatively, I mean, uh, it is interesting to consider uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy rather than uh, a VP shunt just due to the concerns with dissemination of the disease as well. Beautiful. And I see that Robargas has his hands up. Go ahead, Gabriel, please. Beautiful, yeah, Carlos. Just uh, another comment. Uh, when you want to see very up until the aqueduct, so many times it's useful to have an endoscope in your hand. Uh, because that gives you another view of what is the, the, you know, the CSF coming down and all of that without turning too much the, the head uh, like this. So this is another uh, way to, to see, uh, but uh, good, good comments, that comment. Beautiful, beautiful comment. And I think that Lito, you saw when we saw the aqueduct syllabus over there, when we were looking up in the video as well, that's great. Well, great pearls, everybody. You know, beautiful, beautiful discussion. Thank you for leading the discussion. I'm sorry that I was, you know, that I was uh, late, but uh, I think that uh, Carlos or Andres wanted to show for Monday. Go ahead, uh, I, and Diogo, was that you who put this? Yeah, that's Go ahead, what do you wanted to mention? Monday. Just next, next month, we're going to have Dr. Krishna Narvinder presenting on intracranial aneurysm persistence following treatment with flow diversion. Oh, beautiful. We're lo thank you, Krishna, for preparing that talk. On Monday, we're looking forward to it. And then, can you take this off? I want to see one more thing, you know, as we see everybody's faces. Did I get it correctly that I see Dr. Carlos Perez Vega? Did he enter the competition for No Shave November? Is that what I'm gathering? I mean, I think I see a couple of hairs coming out of his upper lips. Is that? Yes, is just that three, right? just three. But yeah, that's correct. <laughs> is that? I mean, are you trying to? I mean, in, uh, did I also see Dr. Akinduro? I mean, he. He's got the goatee. Is that the is that the style? Or, you know, I don't know if everybody knows Gabriel and and, and Dr. Namigera. If you guys know that we enter in November, we have a competition. But we enter. I see Dr. Miller actually. Now this this is good. And I see Allah already, Dr. Miller. So they're going for it. Ricardo. I think he's got a couple of hairs growing as well. You know, a few of them. So you guys are young. You guys have a long way to go. Even Gaetano. Gaetano is the one who's definitely, you know. But I think he's been cheating. I think he's been growing it for like six months or something like that. <laughs> That's great. The rules think... sir, say yeah, to grow a beard or keep growing your beard. <laughs> I check with Dr. Fox. So it's in compliance. I guess it's in compliance. Because last year I saw the pictures. I saw the pictures of Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Chen. He was showing the pictures. And at one point he's so proud of himself. And you had to zoom in. And I think he had like two little hairs coming out. So <laughs> that goes same thing for Henry probably. 
I'm looking at him, which is good. It's a blessing that you guys don't have any facial hair. <laughs> Very good. All righty. Have a great weekend, everybody. Beautiful cases. Enjoy the weekend. Adios, Gabriel. Adios, Jose. Thank you very Adios, much. Adios. Uh, gracias. 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 Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Happy, happy weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.